The Death Worlders, a story by user Hambone. Chapter 19, Baptisms, Part 3. Date point, four years, nine months, one week, and two days after Vancouver. Starship Sanctuary, Deep Space, Julian Etsicity. It's kicking harder than I thought it would. How much harder? Well, like, this gun's kicking about as much as the kind you see in a movie, but the bullets are tiny. Yep, basic rule, Etsicity. You don't learn anything about guns from Hollywood. Sanctuary was a yacht, not built for transport capacity, so its cargo rooms were long and narrow afterthoughts tucked away in an unused structural space on either side of the power core's equator. Aside from the slight curve, they were about perfect for use as a shooting range, and Allison had found a micrometeoroid protection foam that doubled perfectly as a bullet catcher, which she had sprayed all over the back wall. After that, the nanofactory had made it trivial to construct some targets. Okay, so you've got a feel for it, she said, and stepped up to him, just a little bit too close for innocence, aiming her left foot downrange and miming the gun he was holding. So just aim a little bit lower and remember you want to squeeze the trigger. That's not the only thing I want to squeeze. Focus! He slowed his breathing a little and directed his attention to the weapon. This was no different than mastering throwing his hatchet had been. All he needed was repetition. Aim a little lower. Squeeze on the exhale. Whoa. See? I hardly felt it that time. She stepped around him and this time there was contact as she indicated what he had done right. You didn't jerk the trigger so the gun didn't fly up like this, so the recoil didn't make it worse. You see? He saw, and flexed his grip on the gun. He also saw the way her eyes flicked the movement of the muscles in his arm. Then they flicked up and they made eye contact. By some effort of will he held her gaze and this time, this time, she was the one who finally broke eye contact and looked away, clearing her throat and pulse raised. Jesus, Lewis is right. She took the gun off him, gently. So, uh, watch me. Stance, aim, fire, 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 click. She ejected the magazine, checked the gun was safe, and set it down on the bench before pressing the button to recall the target. Their paper hunter had a trio of holes inside the ten-point circle of its razor-toothed mouth that Julian could have fit his thumb over. Show off, he said. She smiled over her shoulder at him, confidence restored. Jealous at Sicity? Yeah. Eh, with practice you might be half as good as me, she teased, putting the gun back in its box. I wasn't talking about the gun. She turned and he was astonished to find that his own feet had carried him up behind her, so that when she did so their belt buckles were practically touching. She put her hands behind her, bracing herself on the table. That smooth son of a bitch upstairs? She asked. Please, like he's half the man I am. She tried to laugh it off. Ego at Sicity. Planet Nightmare. Six years. Figure I've earned it. He leaned just a little closer, watching her lips part and her skin flush. Problem is, that planet doesn't teach you how to be real with somebody. She swallowed a little. Being real, huh? Yeah. Uh, how real do you want? Fucking tell her, you stupid son of a bitch. How? He cleared his throat. How real have you got? Good job, man. Way to wuss out. She blinked at him. Then she kissed him. Sheer surprise almost stopped him from kissing back. Almost. Instinct saved him driving him forward to meet her with a back-of-the-throat noise of delight that came out of nowhere, sending his arms around her waist. She gripped his hair with one hand while the other splayed on his chest over his heart, then moaned softly as he put a hand on her ass and pulled her hips towards his own. Her own hand went straight down the line of his torso and pressed against the front of his jeans, gripping lightly and lingering there for just a second, before she broke the kiss and recoiled as if his dick had burned her. Fuck. Fuck too real. She gasped. Too real, Jesus! Whoa! They let go of each other, pulses pounding. Too real? He asked, 
unsure what to make of that. Too? She kissed him again. Much. Too much, I meant too much. But real enough, God! I'm confused. I just... Can we go for real talk before we do any more real anything else? He slipped his hand around her waist again, gently this time. Talk. You are unbelievably sexy, you know that? All of my turn-ons in one guy, it's crazy. Good, I guess. I just... I can't... Oh, for fuck's sake, Julian, I really, really want to fuck you. I figured... No, shut up and let me say this. I really want to. But we're not going to, okay? Not so long as we're on this ship. Not happening. What a fucking tease. No. Think, dumbass. It took an effort of will, but Julian wrestled his frustrated libido into the corner and the logic presented itself. You're worried about the ship. The mission. Oh, fuck's sake, do you have to understand as well? She exploded. Yes, the mission. Being on this ship, doing something with my life, mattering. I don't want to lose that. So what do you want? The question shut her down for a second as she thought about it. I guess I... What about you? Are we just physical? I... Shit, I don't know. We're a pretty good team and I... I like you. Like me? A fuck of a lot, yeah. Julian smiled sadly. Have we ever done anything other than exercise and flirt? What about your favorite movie? Band. I don't even know where you grew up or what you did before your abduction. I like you too despite all the taunting, but... She shut him up with a kiss. Okay, that's enough real right there, she said. Let's start with all that shit and figure out the rest, yeah? If that's what you want. That's what I want, she confirmed. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, um... So, what is your favorite movie? Allison froze, then glanced up at the ceiling. Julian frowned. What? he asked. Just checking there's no cameras in here, she said. I don't want the guys to hear this. So wait, you'd be fine with them watch- She interrupted him. It's tangled. Tangled? Yeah. I've, uh, never seen that one. Oh, she cleared her throat, tugged down her shirt a little and put her hair back in its ponytail. Uh, do you want to? Sure. There's, uh, just one thing, yeah? What? I, um, like to sing along? He blinked at her, then smiled. I think, he said, that this is going to work. Date point. Four years, nine months, one week, and two days after Vancouver. Folktha Colony Palace, Cimbrian, The Far Reaches Sir Jeremy Sandy While Sir Jeremy had always found Gabriel Ares to be an excellent man to work with, he wished all such senior police officers, superintendents, chief constables, or whatever equivalent rank he had dealt with during his career had been so reasonable. But long years of experience had granted him a sixth sense for when he was about to have a difficult meeting and from the tone of the polite request that Ares had sent, today's was going to be a tough one. He knocked, poked his head into Gabriel's office, and asked, Are you busy? Ares issued a humorless, monosyllabic laugh, <laughs> and beckoned him to enter. Sir Jeremy sat down opposite his closest colleague. So, what can I do for you, Gabriel? he asked. Gabriel finished up what he was doing flipped a sheet of paper into one of the piles on his desk that, presumably, meant something to him, and gave Sir Jeremy his full attention. You realize we've got an independently owned jump array allowing people onto this planet now, right? Yes. 
run by an organization owned by a man who doesn't know about the hierarchy. I don't trust Byron to keep it a secret. What's the matter? Aren't your people screening the immigrants? My people don't know why they're screening for neural implants, Gabriel said. And in any case, that represents one thin blue point of failure, right here in Folkta. The traffic coming through the Scotch Creek Array is at least being checked several times and properly by people who know why it's so important. He frowned. Why are we keeping it a secret, anyway? It's no crazier than some of the other stuff that's happened these last five years. You think people won't believe it? To avoid spooking the bastards into doing something rash, Sir Jeremy replied. The more people we tell, the more clear it is just how seriously we're taking this threat. So long as the hierarchy think we aren't really taking them seriously... When Gabriel frowned uncertainly, he pressed forward. Besides, we don't want a witch hunt on our hands. We can't let the hierarchy terrorize us into jumping at shadows. That's a dangerous game, Gabriel said. A known security hole versus the possibility that they'll get more dangerous if we take them seriously? They know we're on to them already, and for fuck's sake they're trying to genocide us. It's the considered opinion of the GRA, the UN, and NATO that keeping the existence of the hierarchy a secret is, for now, the best course of action, Sir Jeremy stated firmly. I am inclined to agree. And sure, they're right, Gabriel said. But Jeremy, if even one of their agents gets through that array undetected, then we could lose people. We could lose the whole planetary reclamation project. As the closest thing you have to a spymaster right now, I'm telling you Byron needs to know. Byron's a loudmouth, Sir Jeremy responded. Gabriel, if I thought he was at all trustworthy with the secret, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It would already be done. But we are speaking of the literal survival of our entire civilization and species here. Caution must rule the day. Gabriel sat back, sighing. He's really that bad? His exact words to me were, Ethical is a brand. I think he thought he was making a witty commentary on human nature and being so famously honest. I see. That's a tough call. One that I've made. I just hope that your men are vigilant. Vigilant isn't the problem. Overworked is the problem. Our ratio of cops to citizens is way too low right now. Sir Jeremy sat in silence. Gabriel, I'll see what I can do. He said. Maybe Byron can be persuaded to tighten security on his side without being told why. I wouldn't hold on to much hope, though. Do what you can. I'll do what I can. And God take care of the rest, Sir Jeremy said. Very well. Thank you, Gabriel. Sure. Sir Jeremy paused outside Ares's door, and, despite not being a praying man by inclination, still took the time to glance upwards and offer a silent please to the heavens. Frankly, he was quite sure that it was the most he could do. Date point. Four years, nine months, one week, and two days after Vancouver. The Lake. Cimbrian, The Far Reaches, Sarah Tisdale. They didn't have long left before sunset, and Adam was putting in his two lengths to the submerged wreckage of the big ship and back, leaving the girls on the bank to enjoy the last of the sunlight. Ava was quiet, watching the lake, the sun, the trees, and the little animals that were flying, climbing, and occasionally jumping between them all singing a quiet chorus that wasn't quite like any bird song ever heard on earth. Sarah didn't want to intrude. Her friend's expression was serene, her lips curled up at the corners. Ava looked completely at peace. Sarah just wished she could have taken a picture without disturbing her. It didn't last. Eventually, Ava noticed that she was being watched and fidgeted a little though she acknowledged the attention with a smile rather than with awkwardness and said, 
Sorry, I was miles away. You looked really happy. Ava tucked a rope of wet hair behind her ear and looked up at the painted sunset sky, still wearing that faint smile. I feel... lighter, she said. Well, yeah, your jacket always looked heavy to me, Sarah joked. Not just the clothes, Ava laughed. Just, I don't know. She looked out across the lake again. Lighter. Sarah's curiosity had always been her weakness, and her resolve not to intrude on Ava's peace finally gave in. What changed? she asked. Huh? Well, I'm really happy you're here, but a couple of weeks ago you were freaking out over this, and now... She waved a hand at both of them to indicate their mutual sky-clad condition. What changed? Ava put her head on one side, thinking. Being high was really scary, she confessed. Oh, yeah, Sarah agreed, glad that Ava's experience had mirrored her own. It is, isn't it? You've been high? Yeah. I never thought it would be frightening, Ava said. Mom and Dad always made it sound like a horror story anyway, but not like a scary horror story. More like a kind of mind control horror story where the drug makes you do bad things. Oh yeah, I tried some of... Sarah trailed off and dismissed the rest of the story with a wave of her hand. But I got so scared I thought I was going to die. Yeah. Ava looked at the lake again. That's exactly it. I thought I was going to die. And then there was the hospital, and I felt really sick for days. And the doctors were all serious, and some of them looked really worried, like they were out of their depth. That was scary, too. And then? And then I... I kind of accepted it, Ava said. Like, I don't know, like... Like, I wasn't happy about it, but I guess I... Sarah did something uncharacteristic and shut up, letting Ava finish the thought. I guess I... I realize, like, everyone's going to die someday, aren't they? Everyone. Everyone. So why be scared of it? It's going to happen one day, and then there's heaven waiting on the other side, so... Sarah very carefully didn't snort or roll her eyes or give any indication what she thought of Ava's naive belief in heaven. Instead, when Ava drifted off again, looking at the distant black dot that was Adam turning around and beginning the last return leg of his swim, Sarah prompted her to continue. So... Ava shook herself out of it. So I'm alive, aren't I? I've got the chance to do some of the things I'd regret not doing, and this was one of them. She looked back at the sunset. I'm glad I did. This is... She smiled a little bashfully. If I died tonight, my heaven would be right here, exactly as we are. That sounded like one of the most hippie things Sarah had ever heard, but it wasn't a cynical thought. Instead, she felt a swell of vicarious happiness, and, apropos, she scooted over and gave Ava a sideways hug. Thanks for being okay, she said. You really scared us. Ava returned the hug with extra warmth. Thanks, Sarah, she replied. I'd never have had this without you. The sun was just coming into contact with the top of distant hills when Adam reached the shallows near the shore and stood up to wade the rest of the way. Got some bad news, he reported as he shook himself off and used his hands to scrape water from his limbs and trunk. What's up? Ava asked, standing up and offering him a hand to help him up the bank. Some of the trees on the west bank are looking kind of yellow, and they didn't look like that yesterday. Sarah broke the silence that greeted his news. That's it then, I guess. No coming back here. That's life, Adam said, causing Ava to nod in agreement. You've just got to enjoy what you've got while you've got it. To Sarah, that seemed like a very sad thought but neither of her friends seemed to be very upset. Instead, she watched them watch the sunset, holding hands. Before Ava took a huge breath, flapped her arms in a kind of little shrug, and turned away from the lake to retrieve her clothes. 
Adam paused a few seconds longer before following her. Left alone on the shore, Sarah took a moment to squint at the far tree line just to confirm that, yes, there was a patch of sickly yellow over there. Sarah, you coming? She glanced back just to acknowledge that she was, then curtsied to the landscape. Goodbye, Lake. Thank you. She spent most of the trip back, wondering why she wasn't crying. Date point. Four years, nine months, one week, and two days after Vancouver. HMS Caledonia. Orbiting planet Gorai. Gowan Space. Regari. Human starship Caledonia. This is White Crest Clan Personal Transport 337. Requesting permission to approach and dock. Copy 337. Hold distance and stand by. There was a long pause before the human flight controller's voice returned. Whitecrest 337, please state your business. Caledonia, I am a personal envoy of Mother Supreme Giamai. My mission is a diplomatic one. I have no cargo or passengers, and this vessel is unarmed. Again, a long wait. Finally, his anticipation was rewarded. Whitecrest 337, power down your engines and shields and prepare to be tugged into our port flight deck. Complying. Anybody else would have probably felt that the humans were being paranoid, but Regari knew there was no such thing. In a way, their caution was comforting. It was like being surrounded by the terse professionalism of his own clan. He was met on the deck by a squad of male soldiers and a female in a more comfortable dark blue uniform, with some kind of rank marking worn on her chest. The former watched him like a hawk as he alighted, clearly alert for danger and unwilling to relax even though he was plainly unarmed. He approved. The latter, however, held out two pieces of equipment. One was plainly a translator device, which she handed to him. The other was a flat paddle of some kind. I'm subjecting you to a quick search, she informed him. Regari ducked his head in acknowledgement and then stood with his arms and legs outstretched. Curiously, she began with his head, grunting as the wand beeped. It beeped a few more times as she ran it over him, wherever it passed over a metal fastening on his coverall, but she seemed to find that acceptable. You have neural implants, she said. It may have been a question, but Regari didn't detect the uptick at the end of her sentence that was characteristic of the way Shu had asked questions, and which he assumed to be a standard human vocalization. Yes, he confirmed, wondering where she was going with the statement. So long as you're aboard ship, you will remain under marine escort. These are for your protection as much as anybody else's. This is a working warship and we don't want you getting lost or injured, the officer informed him, in an apparent non-sequitur. The gravity in sections of the ship you'll be visiting has been turned down, but you could seriously hurt yourself if you stray outside of those areas. Thank you, he said, agreeing that the escort seemed safest. The officer relaxed and extended a hand, shaking Regari's paw with a human's trademark firm grip, but not with their equally trademark crushing power. Welcome aboard. I'm Lieutenant Ellen McDaniel, this ship's first lieutenant. Captain Bethany apologizes for not meeting you in person. You come very highly recommended, but he does have a ship to run. Thank you, he repeated. I completely understand. Will you come this way, please? McDaniel gestured towards a hatch with one hand. The ship was not originally of human construction, Regari could tell. There was a clear mismatch. The human technology was like stepping into a museum. It was all sturdy metal painted a dull and hard-wearing gray, with visible and almost shockingly low-tech dials and physical controls. Sturdy bulkheads had been installed, lined with easily accessible pipes, power lines, and conduits, every one festooned with bright warning labels, simple diagrams demonstrating their use, and terse blocks of text. Visible below all of that functional steel, however, was something altogether more ornate and elegant. The corridors seemed to be surprisingly wide and tall, as if built for the galactic average, which was decidedly at odds with the small, narrow pressure doors that had been spliced in at regular intervals. The deck plating was totally standard, the product of any shipyard in the interspecies dominion. The firefighting system in the ceiling, on the other hand, had clearly been ripped out and replaced for some reason. The bit that really surprised him, however, 
was that every last scrap of electronics had been replaced. There wasn't a single recognizable wall screen, processing unit, terminal, or display to be seen. The humans couldn't possibly have computers that were on par with those of a more established spacefaring civilization. Could they? McDaniel made a familiar amused noise. A lot of her mannerisms were very much like Shu's. Though, possibly that was just because she was a fellow human female. She was, after all, only the second such that Regari had ever met. But there was a lot to differentiate her from Shu. McDaniel marched, moving at an efficient, brisk pace that Regari could feel in the deck. Shu had always glided, disarmingly soft and silent. Shu's head fur had been long, shiny, and dark black. McDaniel's was much shorter, and a kind of matte yellowish hue that Regari couldn't remember ever seeing in Gowan fur. And where Shu had gone everywhere with her head bowed a little and hunched inwards, making herself small. McDaniel moved like she owned the place, and to judge from the deference shown to her by the ship's crew, she very nearly did. Impressed, she asked. Intrigued, Regari admitted, conscious that while everything he spoke and heard was reaching him in perfect Gowan, the human would be hearing them in English thanks to the targeted interfering sound waves the device was emitting. The effect had always disconcerted him. You've clearly taken somebody else's ship and reworked it to your needs, but I don't recognize the design. I can't discuss the details, McDaniel told him. But yes, this ship was captured and repurposed. A large part of its internal systems are back on Earth now, being reverse-engineered. Regari glanced around. It was hard to gauge the level of advancement that the ship had originally been built at thanks to the human replacements but he got the impression that it had originally matched or likely exceeded the very cutting edge of Gowan hardware. Earth had achieved impressive results with just a few mangled scraps of hunter technology. He wondered what they would achieve with these new, intact trophies. One thing he did notice was that it was eerily quiet. A warship this size should have been permeated by the background hum of its power cores. On Caledonia, the sound came from the crew and the air systems, neither of which were loud. After they had gone down a flight or two of extremely steep stairs, almost ladders, really, McDaniel opened a hatch and politely gestured him into a meeting room of some description, where he sat down. The chairs were a little awkwardly shaped for a gowan, leaving his feet extended outwards well above the ground and sliding his hips forward so as to bend his knees comfortably only induced an uncomfortable bend in his spine. He eventually settled for swiveling the chair a quarter turn and sitting on it sideways. The Marines had remained outside, so, to business then, McDaniel said. Would you like some coffee? How does caffeine affect your species? I don't know, Regari confessed. I don't know what that is. Probably best not then, McDaniel said ruefully. You don't mind if I have a cup, do you? Not at all. McDaniel opened a thermal flask and a strong scent assailed Regari's nose as she poured out a steaming blackish-brown liquid. It smelled... Quite nice, he decided. But it also promised that the substance itself probably wouldn't taste as good as it smelled. At least, not to him. McDaniel sipped it and seemed very pleased with the result. Then she set the cup aside. So, your diplomatic assignment. A plea. One of our own has gone missing. One of your own, too. I don't follow. Regari scratched his ear. How much do you know about our clan of females? he asked. McDaniel shrugged. Less than I would like to before drawing any conclusions, she said. There's certainly no offense intended, the most powerful of your clans by dint of sheer population, and control over the breeding rights, but I can't say I know much more than that. Well, one thing you may not appreciate is that you don't necessarily have to be Gowan to be part of a clan, Regari told her, though that precedent was actually set by a human. Really? McDaniel looked intrigued. Oh, yes. She saved a colony group of mothers, sisters, and cubs from an illicit Cortai science facility some five homeworld years ago, before your species first faster-than-light flight. She couldn't go home. We didn't even know where Earth was at the time. So the females declared her one of their own and took her in. She's officially a sister. And she's gone missing. That's right. I think in your terms, I last saw her just under two years ago. You last saw her? 
Regari ducked his head, ears rotating slightly. Shu is... a friend, he confessed. I was tasked with looking after her and did so for more than a year. Shu? Her name is just impossible for Gowans to pronounce correctly. Shu Shang is the closest I can get. And she just vanished? I think I had better tell you the whole story from the start. Regari told her. Some minutes later, his account was briefly interrupted when a junior of some description arrived and handed McDaniel a hard copy file. Little more than a brown folder and a few sheets of paper. But the face looking out from the first of those pieces of paper was definitely Shu. Albeit looking younger, a little rounder in the face, and a little less stressed than Regari remembered her. Shu Chang, she said, also mispronouncing the name slightly, making it sound like Ju. Abducted from... Ha. Huh. Vancouver, three days before the hunter attack there. Turned 24 last month. Was studying acting at UBC at the time of her abduction. Last known sighting, nearly two years ago. Pretty much a full year before the abductee reclamation program really swung into gear. Aboard a private corporate cargo relay station. That station was handling hundreds of ships a day, Rigari said. By the time we woke up and found her missing, dozens had come and gone. She could have been on any of them. And from there, he made a helpless gesture, ears downcast. I'm the one who taught her how to cover her tracks. Apparently, she was a good student. It says here that she's known to have been wounded by a nerve jam pulse, McDaniel said. Yes, it nearly killed her. That's good bad news. At least it didn't kill her, but those weapons have some terrible long-term effects. How did it happen? Well, as I was saying, we were having a tough fight of it. Date point. Four years, nine months, one week, and two days after Vancouver. Starship Sanctuary. Docked at Free Trade Station 1090. Endless possibility. The Marwakwal system. The signal stars. Kirk. Zane's dense patois, fortunately, was handled perfectly well by the translator, though only after Lewis was instructed to reprogram it. Apparently, Zane didn't approve of having his own Creole echoed back at him. It certainly made conversation much easier. So where did she go? Flight deck 404. I nearly didn't find it, Lewis snickered. We got real lucky there. These things only log the deck plating power draw about every half hour. But the last log was on that deck and flight log, an itinerary for a light bulk transport headed for the Aru system. Departure time, five minutes after that deck plate log. The Aru system? Vedrig had woken from his nearly three-day-long sleep cycle and was fizzing with energy, or at least as much so as an alien the size of a big rig cab could fizz. He couldn't fit into the flight deck itself, but was filling most of the corridor behind it, peering in eagerly. They were still figuring out what his colors meant in the absence of translator implants, but the medley swirling all over him almost certainly denoted fascination and awe. Curiouser and curiouser, Kirk mused. The three human men glanced at one another before Lewis said what they were thinking. So, uh... Care to tell the ignorant monkey dudes what's special about the Aru system? He prompted. It's the home of the Oma Aru, the oldest remaining civilization, Kirk said. Nearly 200,000 Terran years old. So, younger than the Agraeans and Hunters, then, Amir said. I'm quite sure I said civilization, Kirk replied a touch frostily. They're in late decline nowadays and will most likely be extinct within a few decades. Why? Lewis asked. What happened? Kirk and Vedrig exchanged a glance. We don't know, Vedrig admitted. Species die eventually. They stop building, they stop expanding or trading. Eventually they stop reproducing and just die out. Nobody knows why. Isn't that kind of a huge problem? Lewis said. I mean, shit, every species does this? Why isn't... Shit, why isn't everyone looking for a cure? 
This was met with the mutual equivalence of unknowing shrugs from the two aliens, who then shared another glance. Maybe we should look into that, Kirk admitted. It does seem strange. Now that you mention it, yes, it does, Vedrig agreed. Anyway, the Oma Aru are one such species in the last years of their existence. So who goes to their home system? Amir asked. Psychologists? Counselors? Suicide hotline workers? Scavengers, picking over the artifacts, artwork, and advanced technology of the most ancient civilization in the galaxy. Exactly the sort of work where a human's brawn would come in useful, actually. Zane nodded. Well, let's get after her then, he said. Peace, Amir said. Degaussing is going to take another three hours. Zane paused. I'll go pick a bed then, he said, not bothering to say any more as he stalked out. Amir watched him go. Something seem off about him to you, he asked Lewis. Dude, we ship with a white zebra giraffe dude with four arms named after a Star Trek character, a two-ton Mr. Snuffleupagus who glows in the dark, and two of the most sexually frustrated badasses in human history, Lewis said. What does off even mean on this ship? Seriously, though. Lewis glanced back down the corridor past Vedrig. Yeah, something's off about that guy. Date point. Four years, nine months, one week, and two days after Vancouver. HMS Caledonia. Orbiting planet Gorai. Gowan Space. Regari. That's... McDaniel wiped her eye. Damn it. I'm sorry. Regari ducked his head. Please, don't be. Thank you for caring so much. McDaniel nodded, taking a sip of her coffee to recover her composure. She was too professional to speak poorly of the Dominion while in her official capacity as an officer of the Royal Navy. But the story of how they had apathetically kicked that poor, confused slave from pillar to post rather than putting her on a shuttle straight back to Gao had frankly disgusted her. How could anybody have that kind of lack of compassion? She realized that Regari had meant two things by thanking her for caring. Officer Regari, do you know how many of our people are scattered all over the known galaxy? I don't, he conceded. Not many, I assume. We've managed to contact, recover, and bring home a few dozen. And there are about three times as many that we know for certain are dead. That still leaves more than ten thousand unaccounted for, taken over the last forty or fifty years. His ears picked up and forward. That many? I suppose as death worlders we were particularly fascinating, but it's a big galaxy out there. How many stations are there? Of all kinds. I don't know exactly. Millions. Ships. FTL-capable ones of all sizes? Billions, easily. And sapient beings in the trillions. And that's just in and around Dominion space which takes up... What? A third of the galactic habitable ring? The whole galaxy, officially, but yes, in practical terms, about a third... McDaniel nodded. We have an expression. A needle? In a haystack. I'm familiar with it. It's an understatement. Then you see my point. We have only a tiny number of ships, and you're asking us to look for one specific needle out of thousands of needles scattered across an entire continent's worth of haystacks. Yes. You must appreciate that that's... Not exactly feasible. I admire Miss Chang a lot from your description of her, but I can't treat her as being any more worthwhile than any of the other abductees. Regari lowered his head, crestfallen. I suspected you would say that, he said. But Ima insisted that I had to at least ask. From the way you described her, I'm surprised she's not here in person. She would be, but she... Our cub was born a few days ago. The timing was just wrong, so she asked me to come. Shouldn't you be there with her? 
I mean your child. It doesn't work like that for us, Rigari said. We don't do it the way you do. I'm happy. I know the little one will grow up and be an excellent Gowan, just like her mother. That's where my involvement ends. That sounded cold and tragic to McDaniel, but she held her peace. Refraining from commenting on alien cultural differences was one of the most basic rules of diplomacy. Well, I'm sorry that I can't offer more than we're already doing, she said. I understand, Rigari assured her. Knowing the scale of the problem doesn't help, exactly. Shu is important to me, and the Mother Supreme has taken a personal interest in her as well. But I understand. Perspective's a bitch, isn't it? Rigari wrinkled his nose as he interpreted the painfully literal translation of that sentiment. Then he gave one of those Gowan nods. It is, he agreed, and stood. Thank you, Lieutenant. No, thank you for helping us. If nothing else, the Chang family can be told. And now that we know that she's likely to be in disguise, and what that disguise looks like, it might just help the search. I hope so, Rigari agreed, keeping his private doubts private. Please, don't let me use up any more of your time. You have a ship to run. He stuck out a paw, keeping the wince off his face as McDaniel shook it a little too hard. She opened the hatch for him. The two marines waiting outside snapped to attention. Bon voyage, officer, she said. I hope we'll have good news for you. Gentlemen, please escort our guest back to his ship. Aye, aye. This way, sir. Date point. Four years, nine months, one week and two days after Vancouver. Scotch Creek Extraterrestrial Research Facility. British Columbia, Canada. Earth. Brigadier General Martin Tremblay. You're sure about this? I don't exactly trust the Byron Group to know what they're doing. Brown in my pants, but yeah, I'm sure. And they're never going to get better if no fucker's dumb enough to fly with them, right? Yeah, well, watch yourself out there. Our very first scout ship went missing on its first mission. The governess? Yeah, I know, but I'm going to be one of a crew that's got to make a difference. You hope? Trembly cleared his throat. Be careful. Damn it, Martin, I don't want to tear up. They shook hands. It didn't seem personal enough until Kevin shrugged and turned the handshake into a hug. Gonna miss you, man. Trembly laughed a little and broke the hug. Same. The place won't be the same without your coffee and pancakes. Just don't let Maurice change the name. You've got it. Goodbye, Kevin. Thank you for everything. Take care of yourself. Trembly sank back into his chair and allowed himself just a moment's peace as the door shut behind Kevin. But he allowed himself no more than that. There was still a research facility to run. Date point. Four years, nine months, one week, and two days after Vancouver. Starship Sanctuary. Deep Space. Julian Etsicity. Okay, your turn. Huh? What's your favorite movie? It's, uh... Go on. Frozen? Please tell me you like to sing along with Let It Go. I used to sing it on Nightmare. Allison looked up at him in mild disbelief, then smiled delighted at the way his face was turning red. It kept my spirits up, he explained. She smiled and snuggled her head into his shoulder. Oh yeah, this is going to work. Date point. Four years, nine months, two weeks, and six days after Vancouver. Folk the Colony. Symbrian. The Far Reaches. Adam Ares. What about the mountaintop? They're building an observatory up there. Big Bay? Contaminated. Little Bay? Contaminated last week. Come on, Sarah. This place got boring. Adam and Ava nodded. There was no longer any interesting knots of forest to explore. No lakes to leap into, no view that wasn't the clean-picked aftermath of the ravenous logging. 
and with the ballooning population of Folktha beginning to seriously tax the capacity of the colony's basic power grid, rationing had been imposed, which made Adam's PlayStation an occasional luxury rather than a reliable source of entertainment. He'd already used up all his credits. So had the girls. A convoy of trucks bullied past the school, further mutilating the dirt road which was already in dire need of a more permanent surface. Maybe we could go see what they're doing. Dull. It's something. Sarah made a disgusted noise to match her equally revolted expression. I guess. They jogged after the convoy, which pulled in at one of the Byron building sites on the colony's edge, a promised starport, currently an industrial mangrove swamp of cranes and scaffolding, putting their roots down in excavated but unfilled foundations. The kids lined up at the chain-link fence, peering between the corporate hoardings and safety notices, taking it in. The artist's impressions certainly looked pretty, but for now this was just another eyesore. It was hard to imagine how one could become the other. With nothing better to do, they just stood and watched the workers fan out across the construction site, picking up where they had left off the previous night. Guess they're pouring the foundations today, Sarah commented, pointing at a family of cement trucks that were entering the site from the other side, reversing up to one of the foundations, which was basically just a pit, filled with a welded industrial cage of rebar. Adam frowned. So what's that guy doing? he asked. He didn't point, but managed to indicate with the direction of his gaze which worker he was referring to. He hadn't practiced crowd-watching since leaving Earth, but the skill had apparently stuck with him. It wasn't just that the guy wasn't with all the others, it was that he seemed to be carefully keeping some concealment between himself and his colleagues. Maybe he's sloping off for a fag break, Sarah asked. When Adam and Ava gave her a strange look, she sighed. Cigarette. The lone worker found somewhere he was apparently satisfied with, and pulled a brick-sized object of some description from inside his high-vis jacket, which he promptly stuffed into a cement mixer. That didn't look like a cigarette, Ava commented. I don't like this. I'm calling my dad. Are you sure about that? I mean, maybe we should find out what it is first, Sarah said. No. If it's a false alarm, it's no big deal, but if it's dangerous, we should let the FCPA handle it, Adam said firmly. Cell phone coverage in Folkthe was at least ubiquitous. The colony was far too small, flat, and open for that to be an issue, and Gabriel answered on the third ring. Hey, amigo. Dad, we're down by the Byron spaceport site. There's somebody down here acting real suspicious. I'm on my way, Gabriel said. Adam grinned, relieved and delighted that his dad trusted his instincts so implicitly. What's he up to? Slipped away from the other workers and hid something in a cement mixer. Could be a drugs drop. How big a something? Ah, uh, about the size of a big cell phone, I guess. Adam shrugged off a tap on his shoulder. Right. Keep an eye on him, but don't get close, okay? I need to hang up and get down. Oh, shit! Adam swore as he glanced around in response to the increasingly urgent tap on his shoulder, just in time to see Sarah's boots wriggle out of sight under the fence. He rushed to the fence. Sarah, what the fuck are you doing? He hissed. She raised her camera. Getting a picture of this guy in case he slips away. Sarah! She ducked behind a pile of girders. Sarah, for fuck's sake, get back here! Adam hissed as loudly as he dared. She didn't reappear. Oh God, Dad, Sarah just went in there. She's trying to get a picture of the guy. To his horror, he saw the guy who had dropped the whatever it was in the machine pause and glance back, clearly having caught some movement out of the corner of his eye. A second later, he began to march purposefully back toward the mixer, tugging something from the back of his jeans. There was something both wrong and familiar about the way he held it, though. Something in the way he moved. Something that flashed him right back to a roller derby in San Diego. Dad, he said, his voice becoming too calm, too flat, as if his subconscious knew how critical it was to speak clearly now, despite the dryness in his mouth and the pummeling in his chest. The guy just pulled a gun, and he's walking like Mr. Johnson did. Mierda! Adam! Please don't do anything stupid, okay? Sarah's in there. Mantene la calma! 
You go after her, and you'll just give him more hostages and maybe victims. Adam nodded. Swallowed. Entiendo. Hurry. Estoy corriendo. I love you. Gabriel hung up. The phone rang. Pao? Pao, it's Ares. Possible hierarchy at the spaceport site. Armed. One of the kids is in there. Powell didn't even respond. He just dropped the handset and rushed for the door, erupting from it in a whirlwind of screaming orders. Gear up. Jones, get me the ATVs this second. Legsy, who never went by Jones unless the situation was beyond dire, practically teleported in his haste to obey. They were mounted and moving in less than a minute. We've got possible hierarchy at the spaceport construction site, Powell yelled over the engines, performing his weapons check as they went. At least one child mixed up in it, possible hostage, so check your fire. We're going for live capture if possible, but keeping the child alive is priority number one. Be aware of the workers in the area, we're going to be checking them once the kid's secure. Don't let your fucking guard down. Satisfied that his gun was in working order, he hopped off the ATV as it slid to a halt only a few dozen meters from the site. If there are any questions, make them fucking quick, he said. There were none. Silent as ghosts, quick as nightmares. They stormed the construction yard. Oh God! Ava was suddenly animated, pale and shedding distraught tears. Oh God! Oh God! He's gonna find her! What? She's hiding in those cement bags over there. Adam didn't have time to get to the fence and see which ones she meant before he was paralyzed by the firecracker popping of gunfire and the sound of Ava's anguish scream. Armored, armed, and ready to kick ass was one thing. But knowing there were kids in danger and hearing the gunfire had rooted even the SBS team to the spot for just an instant. Fuck. Go. Go. In the next instant... They exploded from among the construction equipment. Their quarry turned and raised his gun towards the first flash of movement. An unseen trooper crashed into him from behind, disarming and restraining him in one smooth motion. Neutralized! Find the kid! His men fanned out, calling out for the girl. Powell didn't need to. The second he stopped and listened, he heard her. He stuck his head over a sack of cement bags. The girl was whimpering and weeping. She was covered in white cement dust. And there was a smear of horribly familiar red around where she was cradling her side. Ross! Powell grabbed the bags and heaved, spilling them everywhere as he dug her out. The girl was small, brown-haired, skinny. The only clean spot on her was where her tears had washed away a pink track in the cement dust revealing a few freckles. There was a lot of blood, and it was staining her mouth as she sobbed. Hey, we've got you, okay? He said, taking her hand. Ross was already joining him, pulling stuff from his bag. You're safe now. We'll get you fixed. Her grip was weak and trembling. She whispered something to him. Scared. Powell was used to death. He had seen men and women die, often by his own hand. Some so close that he could feel their last breath. He had lost comrades in action. Seen what modern weaponry could do to a human being. He had seen death take all kinds of people. He thought he had seen it take children. He had seen enough sad little corpses but never like this. When he closed her eyes, her tears soaked his glove. I'm sorry, guys, I forgot that this was this one. This is um, a thing that I've been referencing for a really long time, just kind of hinting at the horrible turn that this series takes and the catalyst that starts everything that is modern Death Worlders. This is it. This is the moment that the story truly begins. Where the real players start to assemble and everything starts to happen. 
the hierarchy just fucked up really badly. Essentially, they have guaranteed their defeat. Before, it was just impersonal. A whole city gone? That was just trying to get rid of evidence, but this was... This was someone that they loved. And the people that do love Sarah don't take this lightly. I know this is a heavier uh, outro than I usually do, guys, but um, I just want you to know that I appreciate all of you. I love you. I don't, I'm not, I don't just say that because it's, it's something to say at the end of my videos, by the way. I say that because I know that there are people who don't get to hear it. I know that there I know that there are people who deserve to hear it and I want you to know that I care about you. I don't I've never met you, but I care about you. So that's going to be it for this one, guys. I'm uh I'm not going to do the usual shtick, but uh I'll talk to you all later, okay? Bye y'all. Water is good for life, yeah.